not quite sure if my original uh, intro has has gone out, but let me let me repeat it. Um, welcome everyone to uh, the day three of our 26th annual National Security Law Conference here at Duke Law School, sponsored by the Center on Law Ethics and National Security. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our donors, and I'd also like to thank our tech crew and our admin support. It's really uh, to put on something this complex, you can imagine it, it takes a lot of people. I'd also like to thank those from uh, our community who are regular lens attend attendees. As I mentioned yesterday, I'm thrilled that we have so many students and members of the armed forces, but we also have our, our core group of local attendees. Uh, we have a very special panel this morning, uh, and I'm just thrilled of the people that we are able to have the people that we do for this panel because it's the top experts. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce them. I invite you to take a look at their longer bios by checking out the links on the agenda. But um, I had we have Mr. Paul Rosenzweig. Uh, Paul's coming from a, to us actually from Costa Rica right now. But Paul is the founder of Red Branch uh, Consulting and was formerly the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy uh, and also the former Acting Assistant Director for International Affairs. I think he did that twice, I, I think, Paul, mm -hmm. and um, in the Department of Homeland Security. And he's also a senior fellow at the R Street Institute. And by the way, uh, if some of you may have heard of the teaching company. Paul has, I think, two courses on teaching company and that I've taken. Uh, if you're new to this area, uh, they can help you get started and uh, build your intellectual database, so to speak. I'm also thrilled to have uh, Professor Gary Korn with us. Gary is a retired army colonel, uh, but he is currently, and he was formerly the staff judge advocate, which means he was the senior lawyer at US Cyber Command. Uh, he's currently the director of the Tech Law and Security Program at American University's Washington College of Law. And he's also a senior fellow at the R Street uh, Institute. Uh, and, and our third member is our own uh, David Hoffman, our longtime supporter of uh, the Lens Conference. And David is here at Duke University. He is, um, he's at the Sanford School of Public Policy and he is still the Associate General Counsel at Intel Corporation. And something I would invite you to do is to, to check out uh, his website uh, at, through the Sanford School here at Duke because he's running a law and policy lecture series, which I think with Professor Stansbury of, the, of our center here. And it, it's, uh, there's some really interesting people that have been presented. Thank you, David, so much for, for joining us. Uh, I'd like to kick off the discussion um, with uh, something called solar winds. People have seen this in the headlines. Uh, they know it has something to do with cyber. Uh, not everyone knows, is this a big deal or, or what's this about? Paul, could I impose on you to, you know, Get us started. What what is solar winds? Uh, is it important? Should we care? What do you think? Well, <laughs> the very short A answer is we're still learning. Uh, we're in the middle of the investigation. But even given what we know right now, <clears throat> the in, the solar winds intrusion is probably going to go down as the single largest and most significant intrusion in at least in the last 10 years and possibly for longer. Uh, it is actually uh, three, at least, that we know of separate sorts of intrusions. One, through a series of programs built by a company known as SolarWinds. Another, through a flaw in some of Microsoft's crowd, cloud services. And a third, smaller one, at least it seems so now, through the services provided by a company called VMware. Uh, First, let's start with a basic timeline, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what it is. The timeline is simple. Um, <clears throat> we know for sure that the solar winds package of intrusion started no later than March of 2020. We also know, or we think we know, 
that nobody was aware of this until December of 2020. So that gives you a sense of the timeline between the start of the problem and when it's discovered. And it was first announced publicly by a company known as FireEye, which is a private sector cybersecurity company in mid-December 2020, when they discovered an intrusion into their own systems uh, and, and made a public announcement of it. Uh, for the lawyers in the group, uh, that announcement was not mandatory. So it was simply something that FireEye chose to do uh, for its own corporate purposes. And so one of the legal issues that buries underneath this is things like mandatory reporting of breaches. And um, we can maybe talk about that at some point. So what exactly was it and why was it significant? Um, all three of these have uh, types of intrusions have one thing in common. Instead of being kind of frontal assaults where they came in across the walls, the outer perimeters, the firewalls of a cyber system, each involved an intrusion into the actual supply chain of the software that unknowing consumers downloaded and installed. So for example, Sol SolarWinds runs a uh, network program called Orion. And the malicious intruders actually got inside the development and building system for Orion and put their malicious code into that into that system so that in effect, when you downloaded an update or a patch of Orion, you were also downloading malicious code. And that's really, really uh, significant for two reasons. The first is it's remarkably hard to identify and, and, and stop as it's happening. And the second is that supply chain attacks means that everything that you're doing basically to defend yourself against outside intrusions within your architecture is pretty useless because the bad guys are already inside the castle. It's a horrible metaphor, I hate it, but it's the best I can do to describe a complex series of, of things. The second piece of this that you need to know is who, what, who it was. All indications are that it was a, a Russian uh, intelligence military service called the SVR, and that this was a longstanding campaign run by the Russian military and thus the Russian government. So it was actually a national attack. And the third thing, and last thing, and I'll close here is who was the victim? And the answer is basically everybody who used any of these services at least got the, down, the bad downloads. And that includes lots of agencies of the US government, over 18,000 customers of SolarWinds, potentially as many customers of Microsoft's cloud services. Now, not all of those had bad things happen to them. The, the Russians would only activate the malicious software and, and intrude and download files and conduct espionage against a select few of the potential victims. But theoretically, at least, there are 20, 30,000 victims, and that means 20, 30,000 companies that need to clean their systems of the offending malicious code before they can be safe again. And that's why it's a pretty big deal. Paul and, and anyone else on, on the panel, is it possible that with this intrusion, the Russians could have left malware on there that had, could potentially be physically destructive? Well, we've seen no evidence of that so far, but as a theoretical matter, you know, the payload is independent of how the malicious code propagates and an intrusion, a propagation, and an exploit to enter into a system can carry with it any number of different payloads. And so the theoretical technical answer is, I think, yes. I'm willing to be corrected, but my understanding is it's yes. Yeah, Herb, Herb Lynn has kind of indicated that, that we don't know what, what may or may not be, and that, that seems um, kind of logical. Gary, um, we hear a lot in, in the press and so forth about this notion of active war. And now that we're pretty sure it was, it was the Russians, uh, what does that mean? You know, active war doesn't seem to have a, a legal, uh, that phrase per se is not legal, but, but it, it does have some political implications. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, and let, let, me, let me start by one saying, this is, this is serious stuff. This is bad. And as I've written, you know, it's at a minimum, we were seriously outmaneuvered by a primary adversary. 
um, and and that should be galvanizing everybody's attention. Uh, and you know, to your prior question, one of the challenges that's always uh, present in these operations is understanding and being able to, to sort of forensically decipher what is this limited to espionage? Uh, you know, what is the the ultimate end game of, a, of an operation? And it can be murky. Uh, and you know, access is sort of the coin of the realm in cyber operations, and this enabled access at scale. Um, and so, you know, you don't even necessarily always have to have a sort of malicious payload to have the ability to inflict malicious, uh, you know, outcomes on systems if you're able to gain root access, et cetera. So, you know, there is a lot of unknown here, but as Paul indicated, right now, all the indicators are, um, and not the least of which is the entity that is so far being, um, you know, fingered as the, 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 the source behind this operation, the SVR, an espionage operation. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be on sort of high alert to kind of figure this out, root out every piece of, you know, where there's access um, and, and trying to make sure we are shutting down possibilities here. But as to the, you know, act of war question, um, you know, Yev Vinman wrote a, a, an interesting and provocative piece on lawfare um, essentially saying this could be a causus belli, uh, you know, the, the sort of translation of the generic term of active war. It, if the United States determines that it is, which is a bit cynical and a bit reality in the sense that ultimately these are highly political questions. Um, you know, when a state looks at a scenario and says, no mas, like this is this is more of a, of a threat than we can withstand, they're gonna react differently. But strictly speaking, as a matter of international law, focusing on a question of whether something is an act of war is somewhat, I would say, a distractor. One, because that's not the terminology that states have evolved toward using in the use ad bellum and the, in the international law that governs when states can resort to force. Um, and so, you know, the question is whether this is a use of force and or an armed attack under <laughs> the um, Right now, it, it, it would, it's hard to say based on the facts that we have seen certainly publicly that it reaches those thresholds. And, and there's an important question as well. Um, if you're gonna take the step of, of calling something an act of war or a use of force, uh, there's, you should have good reason to do that. And I, I would say, you know, beyond simply screaming about it, you need to be prepared to act on it. And, and you know, what gets lost in these conversations oftentimes when we gravitate immediately toward that question is, are you asking because the response options that we want to have available involve actually using force in response um, and, and putting lives on the line for this? Again, I emphasize this is bad. And I also emphasize that whether or not it's a use of force, just because you determine that it's not, does not constrain you um, completely from responding. We have options. There's indications right now coming out of the administration that, that you know, options beyond sanctions are under contemplation. And there's a, a rich discussion about what the internet, what international law has to say about those response options below that that armed attack threshold or use of force threshold. And there is plenty of maneuver space, um, I would say, to take it back to the adversary and counter the adversary's ability to do this stuff. And we can follow up on that. I, I really want to come back to that discussion uh, for a bunch of different reasons. But before I do, David, uh, can you give us a sense of uh, what Looking at the private sector, how's the private se sector reacting to solar winds? What do you have any sense of what what their view is, and, and what they're concerned about? Sure, Charlie, a, a little bit on this, and I, I just want to emphasize a couple of things also that Paul and Gary said that are so important also for how the private sector is responding to this. Uh, I think Paul's notion and that Gary LCO emphasized of we're still learning people still don't fully know. And then the notion of asking the question, 
whether it was an act of war and saying, look, it looks like a surveillance operation, but we don't know completely. So all it would take, for example, would be instead of just using this unauthorized access to be able to take data and to learn, but instead to change some of that data, imagine data changed in industrial control systems or data uh, changed in uh, hospitals and healthcare networks. You could easily have situations that people could die later because of data integrity issues now. And so there's a tremendous amount of investigatory work, but this particular attack is so vexing for the private sector because we have spent 20 years telling everybody in the private sector what you want to do is enable software updates as quickly as you can because that's going to be better for your cybersecurity because software updates are going to be the way that private sector entities that develop software, hardware, and services are going to deploy security patches and you're going, to want to, you're going to want to get those software updates loaded as quickly as possible. Well, now you have a situation where your private sector entities at risk because of potentially a nation state attack that might, by the way, a lot of people are saying be broader than SolarWinds. We call this the SolarWinds attack so, because now everybody knows what that means. People are saying, look, it looks like SolarWinds was not the only company that was a target. Should we be calling this the Cozy Bear attack? Should we be focusing not on one of the victims, which was SolarWinds, but should we be focusing actually on the attacker, which looks to be a group of attackers funded and resourced out of the Russian government? The idea that this has become about one of the victims who then software was used to propagate this throughout the private sector, I think is concerning for a lot of private sector entities when they think about the lack of ability for them to be able to protect against a foreign nation state that decides that it wants to intrude the networks of those private sector companies. Yeah. You know, uh, it probably is unfair to call it solar winds. And I think uh, Stuart, Stuart Baker was talking about, and Yev, I think, talked about that in his, uh, in his piece, that it probably shouldn't be called solar winds, but when something gets into the, the popular vernacular, uh, we, I, I want to go on to some other, some related things to that, and I want to. I think Paul has a has a reattack on that. But before we do, and if you could include this, Paul, and perhaps your response or somebody else, do you have a question from uh, from Russ Kilpatrick? And I think it may be on the minds of, of a lot of folks. Is how about for the your own individual home computer? Are are you at at some risk as a result of this, Paul? Did you have could you well, handle that or and also your I, I can do that. I just wanted to respond to David and say it, it is a bit unfair to solar winds, but you know the the one piece of evidence that we do know thus far is that the solar winds people had remarkably poor se security, right? Uh, there and we there should was, talk about that. Yeah, yeah there was right. testimony yesterday that some of the critical developers had passwords like solar winds one two really oh my goodness well and and what's remarkable about that also even i is... who cannot program to buy name one two three or name plus ac and throw it at a system yeah uh so uh so so let's not let solar winds off that lightly right um as for as for individual risk uh i would say very, very little, right? Most of this attack is has been targeted so far as we know at enterprise level systems. As David was saying, hospitals or our industrial control systems, uh, you as an individual don't use SolarWinds Orion networking server software, right? So it would be a two-step process to go to some enterprise that had your data and then steal your data and go after that. and. It, by all accounts, you know, there's lots easier ways to get your personal data than for the Russian SVR to steal it from your uh, from the Duke uh, hospital uh, health system and then repurpose it. So, so happily, you know, the, the indications so far, and again, we don't know what we don't know, but the indications so far are that uh, 
nobody on this call is likely to have their credit card stolen, credit card number stolen because of this hack. You're going to lose it somewhere else. Yeah, Gary. I think I, I think that's I think that's right. Just one thing, real quickly, Charlie, that Paul highlights, which is really important for what this attack really means, is that also. So we now find out that Solar Winds had all these bad cybersecurity practices, but we had thousands of organizations, including really robust, high-profile private sector entities, that were relying upon Solar Winds software for doing network administration. It raises real issues around supply chain cybersecurity and what vendors you're relying upon and how do you determine that that vendor is actually doing a good job of protecting their systems. Gary? Yeah, just two points real quick. I mean, agree absolutely with David. And it's a question of, you know, how much trust environment do you do you operate in? And, and should we be moving to zero trust, uh, which introduces friction in the in the sort of business relationships and the and the product flow and everything else. So there's tension there. But um, and, and agree with Paul, you know, I would say risk of what um, I, I sort of obviously my profile is a little bit different maybe than the average American. But you know, I almost take as a given that that I'll do everything I can to secure my home systems, but they could easily be compromised as a as a hot point or a waypoint. Um, you know, that's the nature of the environment, unfortunately, today, where every device device that's connected in can be something that can be leveraged in operational infrastructure from a, for an adversary. Now, that doesn't translate necessarily into you losing your personal data and other things that may be that your router is just a, as I said, a hop point or a waypoint for someone else's operations. Um, and so now you're into a discussion of how much is it decrementing your computing power? Probably not noticeable, but still it's concerning. And, and it, you know, there's, there's got to be a, a way of elevating sort of the tide of security for everybody. Um, Obviously, you have to prioritize. There are certain entities, infrastructure, other things that matter more than my individual router. But this is a this is a sort of cultural mentality thing. Everybody you know, in the chain. You know, when when we think this through, uh, you know, historically from an international law perspective, you know, espionage has not been violated. Violation of international law would be violating of domestic law. But do we need to rethink that given the extraordinary capabilities of cyber? You know, when the international law norm evolved, we weren't talking about, you know, being able to affect millions and millions of people. And along that line, our friend uh, who we all know, Harvey Rishikov, has a question. He says, do we need to rethink the terms con uh, computer network attack versus computer network exploitation? Um, in light of, this is not Harvey's word, but in my words, but in light of the enormous capability of cyber, does, does that change the conversation? So when I, when I teach this or talk about this, um, I, I usually make reference to the opening of the movie, Bridge of Spies, where if you'll recall, a very bucolic scene, the older gentleman in a park, he reaches underneath the bench. It's obviously a dead drop. He pulls something very small out, goes back to his apartment, and he opens up a false nickel where he pulls out a tiny piece of paper, uh, you know, with micro writing on it that he's now going to decipher. You know, imagine all the effort and resources that had to go into being able to extract that little amount of data and compare that to a situation like OPM where you have gigabytes of highly sensitive data being extracted at scale. I, I think that um, you know, across all the different things we talk about, whether it's cyber effects operations, espionage, information operations, which are now, we know we're sort of waking up to the, to the problem there as well. I always, it's always a question sort of of scope, scale, depth, and speed that are making this, I'd say, you know, traditional activities non-traditional um, and causing us to have to rethink them. Having said that, um, you know, one, the, the term CNA, CNE, um, you know, internal to government, those terms have kind of fallen away a little bit, but I don't, I don't imagine, I don't see states necessarily stepping out 
too boldly to say espionage um, is now something that we are going to place limitations or restrictions on and prohibit, you know, beyond some distinctions that have been drawn between economic espionage versus traditional national security espionage, a view of the United States, not a view necessarily shared by all states, um, you know, because let's face it, there's, there's um, also advantage to being able to uh, conduct these operations, right? So I, I don't know that that needle is going to move anytime soon when it comes to espionage. Yeah, I, I think that that's an important point. And I think you have made that in his, uh, in his article that we may characterize something in a certain way, but it doesn't mean we necessarily have to act on it. Uh, in other words, even if we did decide to, to move the needle and, and say that we consider this the equivalent to a use of force, as controversial as that may be, doesn't mean that we have to you know, start bombing people or anything like that. But nevertheless, you know, I, I think, and I'd like to hear y'all's view, is it important to establish a norm and leave open what the reaction to that may be? Or is the US inhibited from doing that because it may not want that to be the norm, uh, notwithstanding this vulnerability that's been exposed? Paul, do you have a thought on that? So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I hear Gary and, and, and I totally understand the real politic of the likelihood of international law norms you know, being significantly changed by so state practice. So, you know, I have come around to the view that if it's possible to do so, we should try to get, a, get out of that uh, box. Yeah, you know, when I teach cyber law and policy, I always characterize what we're doing with respect to cybersecurity issues as trying to pour new wine into old bottles. We're taking existing legal constructs and we're trying to stuff and fit uh, uh, the new reality of cyber enabled everything into those constructs, whether it's Fourth Amendment law and searches of cell phones or uh, espionage and laws of armed conflict and just ad bellum. And mostly that's okay, but often the velocity and the virality of, of activity on the network really means that we should try and think of something different. Now, I don't have a name for it, but I am persuaded that an espionage operation that impacts over 20,000 American private sector companies, right, uh, who are now going to at least have to clean out their systems and who are potentially subject to economic espionage activities and where there are potential knock-on adverse collateral kinetic real-world effects that we haven't yet identified is different, not just in scope and scale, but in character from Gary's guy on Bridge of Spies, uh, you know, or, or the classic spy taking the little micro dot pictures in the, you know, in the E-ring of the Pentagon. Uh, I don't know what that means uh, necessarily for ter in terms of reactions uh, and in terms of international law, but I do know, or I think I do know that America's response to this sort of intrusion from a Russian SVR uh, has to be something different than, oh, we do it ourselves. And if we could do it to the Kremlin, we would. Uh, it's got to be the development of structures that deter that kind of behavior uh, in ways that make the environment more secure. Otherwise, every company that, uh, that you know, I invite David to talk about is going to be on edge. And that's just the reality. Uh, I can identify the problem. I, I fear I don't have solutions as readily as I should. David, uh, A, I'd, I'd like to, to know your perspective uh, and what you think this, the private sector perspective would be. But since we have started talking about espionage, we, it brings us into intelligence agencies. What do you think the role of, of the intelligence agencies ought to be in computer uh, and cybersecurity versus maybe what it has been and, and what, it, what it could be? 
Yeah, I think I'd be really interested in Paul and Gary's uh, thoughts on that also. I, I think where we've been going with this discussion uh, and particularly asking, you know, is this an act of war? What it would it take for it to be an act of war? What are the legal authorities that would allow us to respond? To me, those are all second order questions. And the first order question would be, for, what should we learn from this about how we could minimize the uh, uh, effect or minimize the likelihood that this is going to happen in the future. And that's what the private sector is saying, look, if this is a foreign nation state attack, we need help from the government to protect against foreign nation state attacks. And that causes us then I think to have to look and say, are there things in our legal authorities for how we empower and enable our government agencies that could be addressing this, particularly the uh, National Security Agency, that are actually providing opportunities and gaps for the foreign actors to be able to exploit. And I think there's been tremendous work to take a look at that. And I think as you've seen CISA be stand up at, uh, stood up at DHS, the Cybersecurity Directorate being stood up at the NSA, and Cyber Command becoming more and more robust and those agencies understanding how to work together in concert with ODNI and with justice, you're seeing tremendous capability being built by the United States. And so from my perspective, if you're gonna look at foreign nation states attacking the private sector, you have to presume that the private sector is not gonna be able to defend against that and so to me, one of the best ways that you're gonna potentially minimize the risk of this happening again is increasing the ability for the US government to have surveillance activity to understand when other countries are acting in this space and planning these types of attacks. I think that's an area we really need to take a hard look at and say, Ooh. do we have the right authorities in place to allow the kind of surveillance collection by the United States to understand when foreign nation states might be planning attacks like that. And there are some really hard questions. Let me just give one and that I'd be really interested in what other people think. For very good reasons for the protection of US person privacy, we have restrictions on the NSA about when they can do surveillance uh, without, uh, without a warrant being obtained by the uh, government. Uh, based on probable cause uh, for entities that are US, per, uh, US persons. That breaks down and gets very difficult when you're talking about IP addresses and observing IP addresses. When is an IP address relating to a US person or a non-US person? If a foreign entity manages to get inside a US network and use US IP addresses, does that mean that it's much more difficult for us to spot in the systems that we're setting up? These are really hard questions that we need to start digging into to say, have we created roadmaps in our authorities that allow foreign nation states to be able to game the system and find the gaps where they can attack the United States? Uh, Gary, I thought that, um, and I don't know if you can answer this, but I thought defend forward was supposed to be giving us the kind of heads up that, that David, I think, is talking about. And, and for everybody, as we think about that, for everybody, we've had two, two questions, you know, along the line of kind of the shocking, I'm really actually shocked that SolarWinds, their, their uh, passwords were as simple as they were. But um, Ko John, asks, you know, do we have to implement more strict laws, perhaps security laws related to obliging company, private companies to report these things? And along that same line, Travis Vaughn asks about, geez, do we have to do something with the DFARS to make sure that the supply chain companies are, uh, are doing enough to make sure that th this risk is being mitigated or addressed? So a couple of yep. points. Yeah. Um, you know, ag agree wholeheartedly with David. We, we have to some degree self-imposed gaps and seams that our adversaries are identifying and taking full advantage of. Um, you know, if, if SolarWinds is emblematic of anything, I think it's that. 
that is just a really difficult issue to attack. Uh, we have tried over time to, to close that gap uh, through you know, public-private consensual partnership and, and sharing of information. Um, that has proved difficult for you know, a number of reasons. It's gotten better in certain areas, um, but it's, it, it just hasn't closed down the gaps and seams. The incentive structure, the various legal ob uh, obstacles, you know, there's a lot to be discussed there and, and we should continue to kind of pursue that. But it still leaves open a separate question. Uh, and I'd say sort of currents are running in different directions. In one sense, we're seeing the need to have better sight picture of what's happening on domestic infrastructure. How you defend the, na the national infrastructure without being able to actually put eyes on the objective, so to speak, uh, is really challenging. Um, but we have a legal architecture that has you know, developed over time for good reasons that David has alluded to in protecting US persons, et cetera. Um, but it's mostly statutory. Although there are some trends in, in Fourth Amendment law that seem to be sort of ensconcing some of the things that have been laid in as a statutory matter, um, as a constitutional matter. So that, that gives you challenges, not to mention sort of the cross-cutting issues now that are coming out of, uh, you know, the Schrems II decision and, and you know, cross-border data flows and the Europeans looking at the United States saying, we ignore our own security apparatus, but we condemn yours as not privacy protective where anybody who does a, you know, a cross comparison knows that that's just not true. Um, but there's lots of different pressures there that would make it very hard, I think, to re-architect our legal in, you know, structure to allow greater surveillance domestically. But that's an issue that has to be taken on, in my opinion. Paul, you know, you, you were on the, on the inside with uh, Homeland Security. And how do you think that, do you think that there's going to be the political will to do the kind of things that uh, David and Gary have been suggesting? Well, if I had, uh, you know, I, I should, I guess I should start by saying if I actually knew the answer to that question, I'd be much richer than I am, right? Because uh, I'd be making money on prediction markets and things like that. Uh, that having been said, you know, I think that the cycle of uh, cyber uh, policy development is, it, it's cyclical. Something bad happens, we do something, then we slow down, and then something bad happens again, we do something again, and we implement it, and then we get complacent, and we go round and around and around. Uh, each one of these incidents, each, each set of incidents creates its own energy. You know, one was the Cyber uh, uh, Information Sharing Act of 2015. Then there was the creation of CISA. Today, it's the Cyber Solarium Commission and the creation of a national cyber director. We tend, I think, to focus far too much on uh, inside Washington boxology, who's got what responsibilities and, and how to coordinate people. And in the end, what we have is many people sort of headed in the same direction but with all sorts of competing instincts and, and, and inabilities. Um, we are using a old hierarchical system of governance, if you will, to manage a, a domain a, a, that changes and mutates at scale at a pace that far outstrips our ability to follow it. Um, and so, I think that what we're going to see in the next round is some response to solar winds, maybe better uh, supply chain requirements on providers like solar wind, maybe mandatory reporting of breaches so that it's not uh, at fire eyes discretion, but we have to do that. Uh, and uh, maybe resiliency requirements of some sort, but it won't actually muster the political will to do something fundamental. And, and when I say fundamental, I think that the fundamental thing is uh, development of a strategy 
and a willingness to confront our adversaries uh, you know, it, on grounds that are, are, are their weak points. Our adversaries confront us today at our weak points. As Gary said, the seams between uh, uh, foreign intelligence and domestic security. Uh, we haven't alluded to it, but as the Russian attack on the electoral system in 2016 developed, the seam of, of free expression. And we have those seams. We're never going to get rid of them because they're endemic to our society. And I wouldn't want to get rid of most of them. Uh, but until we identify seams like that in Russian and Chinese uh, organizations and muster the political will to affirmatively attack those, we're going to be on the wrong end of this for a long time to come. We have a, we have a bunch of interesting questions that I, I want to do a better job today at addressing attendee questions. And, and related to that, um, uh, Susan Trebinsky, and pardon me, ma'am, if I totally butchered your name there, uh, her question is essentially uh, when something happens and, and there's a reaction, uh, how and that's very important in terms of international law to, to establish the norm. And what happens when we seem to acquiesce? You know, are we allowing, you know, the, the business as usual? And Kayla Fries, uh, one of my students, uh, she wants to know that if we do escalate, uh, what should be the, the tripping point? Is it, should we really be focusing on, would large scale economic impacts be sufficient? And, I, and one more, just to throw it into the mix to give you guys plenty, plenty of things to, to try to answer. Um, Ava Lorenz said, uh, she wants to know, is there anything we can do in, in, to make more robust the public-private partnership uh, to be more proactive, proactive in addressing these, because uh, we, we do seem to be mainly reactive. There's a lot out there. Who who wants to who wants to take a shot, Gary? Well, I think part of this relates back to your earlier question that we didn't get to about defend forward, right? Um, and, and the last question you just posed, I'm very interested in hearing you know David's approach and or response to that. But in terms of acquiescence, um, that was sort of the heart of the thinking behind the shift in 2018 in the DoD's cyber strategy that we had been acquiescing that we had been self-restraining um, in terms of countering these threats. And so you need to shift your posture to one um, that involves, not as a panacea, not as the, the sole means of improving our overall national cybersecurity, but as a component, an operational uh, approach of defending forward, meaning conducting operations outside of our networks. Right, to get as close to the source of adversary infrastructure to be able to have disruptive effect and make it harder for your adversary to achieve benefit with its operations against you. Um, there's a lot of complexity there to, to, to parse out, but that was in essence the heart of it. Um, you know, and so there, yes, we should not be just acquiescing because law aside, you're just simply inviting further bad behavior by the, those who are trying to, you know, attack or take advantage of you. Um, now, you know, defend forward, like I said, is not offered as the end all and be all solution. Um, I've written it's at a, you know, very early phase of its implementation. Um, and we should sort of be careful about assessing, you know, why is it that the defend forward quote unquote failed here? Uh, you know, that's something that's going to take a lot of unpacking. I'm sure there's a lot of internal um, sort of after action reviews going on and looking at that. But, you know, one, it is primarily, as I said, a concept of taking actions to disrupt. Uh, there's a there's an identification element to that. There is an intelligence collection element to that. That is not uniquely for Cyber Command. Obviously, it's not an intelligence uh, component not you know member of the intelligence community uh you know there's some some authority there but it's mostly then how are you arraying your your intelligence community assets and prioritizing etc 
Um, and I think, you know, there's just going to be a deep look to all of that to see how we improve that entire structure and posture to prevent this going forward. David, what, what do you think about the whole public private partnership? You know, we've been talking about that for, for years. Uh, what are your thoughts? Sure, uh, Charlie, I, I think one thing that Gary's pointing out is critical and it's critical for understanding where we're headed with the public-private partnerships, which is we to have a tendency for good reasons, because we always want to improve, but something happens, we have an incident and immediately we leap to how could we let this happen? What are, why are all of these bad things happen? Instead of necessarily asking, wow, that's uh, maybe it's really a good thing that we haven't seen this before this point, or it's really good that we were able to respond pretty quickly. I, I think we have to look at where the gaps were, which we've been talking about. We also have to look at some of the strengths that we have and some of the reasons why we actually may be mitigating some of the risks right now and being successful. I, I completely agree with Gary that both defending forward and persistent engagement, we are early in being able to follow that as a strategy. What the NSA has been able to do, the creation of the Cybersecurity Directorate, the protection of the 2018 and 2020 elections, the work that CISA was able to do in that space has been tremendous. And we have to recognize that. And we also have to look at the other role other than signals intelligence that the NSA has, the information assurance role of working with the private sector for tech, assuring the level of robustness for technology that's gonna be used in national security systems. This is a key feature of the way we have our systems set up and with a recognition that as the risks increase, we need to deploy as a co country, not just only our government entities, but also the kind of innovation that's happening in the private sector around cybersecurity to help mitigate those risks. And you're starting to see this, the, the, um, the environment and the ecosystem around cybersecurity, the number of companies that are pop, uh, popping up that can play an effective role in helping the government mitigate those risks is tremendous. And there's a lot of venture capital moving in that direction. If we're gonna do that, what it presumes, and Gary was talking a little bit about this, is that we're gonna have the right oversight and controls to make sure that, that those relationships between the government and the private sector are appropriate, particularly for protecting the privacy and civil liberties of individuals. I think this is once again, we need to look particularly in light of SHREMS, and I've written a lot about this, which is we have to recognize we have the best system of oversight and controls over our intelligence activities and to protect privacy and civil liberties of any country in the world. And I, I think there, I don't know a single scholar who's looked at this who has disagreed with that. We can lean in there. That is a competitive advantage that we can look at and say, because we have such great controls and even maybe we improve them in certain ways that I know a lot of people are looking at that because of the Schrems case. Uh, it, how do we lean into that that allows us to enable those private and public partnerships to help protect us in better ways? I, I, think, it's, I think it's a feature, not a bug. You know, um, you know, I, we, we do talk a, a lot about this, but what, what's your hope for, I mean, do you really think that we'll, we'll get to the implementation of some of the things that, that you've been talking about? Do you think we'll, we'll be able to move the needle? Because there are, I, I think you make a very good point that's often lost about the oversight of our intelligence act activities, especially when you vis-a-vis -vis Europe in particular complains a lot, but we have unbelievable oversight of our intelligence agency. But um, what what is your assessment of the, of the public, uh, of us, how we project our narrative as to what we, uh, as to what the US can do and, and what we should be doing? How a quick comment, and then uh, I'm really interested in what Paul and Gary said. I would just say, first of all, I think we have moved the needle. I think if you look at everything the government did between 2016 and 2020 on cybersecurity, particularly to protect elections, 
we are, are were greatly served by our public servants. Uh, what happened within CISA at DHS, what happened within the NSA, not just from a capability perspective and what Ann Neuberger did, uh, particularly at the Cybersecurity Directorate, but also what happened in the protection of privacy and civil liberties, the work that Becky Richards has been doing uh, in, in concert with other privacy and civil liberties experts within the government has been absolutely tremendous. Uh, I, I think there's really great capability there. And I'm really hopeful on the norms perspective. The OECD has now jumped in. And the OECD has said, this is not an issue from a Schrems perspective about just the United States having government agencies that are going to access private sector data. If the United States is not adequate in its oversight and controls, like how is anybody going to be able to trust to use technology from Israel, from Pakistan, from India, from China? Like what does this mean on the overall trust of technology created and used by the private sector. And I think as we have the discussion around those norms, I think we are gonna find that the United States is doing a better job of following those global norms than any other country in the world. Paul? Well, you know, I love David's optimism. Uh, and to, no, no, and to some degree, I, I have always shared it. Uh, and I certainly agree that the last four years have been extremely positive in the field of cyber security. Uh, the only thing I would add, which is uh, an unfortunate reality, is that I also think that the last four years have done uh, significant damage to the United States' reputation for oversight and audit at the next level up of generality, at the national command level, um, and, and I, I, I can, I can, I certainly have views upon why that is, but I think it's indisputable that one can characterize the level of overall trust in U.S. government uh, today as less globally than it was four or five years ago. And, uh, and so while David is, I think, right to say that in a properly functioning American system, uh, the uh, ability of our structures to conduct oversight and audit and uh, advance uh, both the rule of law and good security at the same time is second to none and superior to that advanced by the Europeans in their you know, efforts to sometimes say that they're better than us. But it is also, I think, true that uh, that reality has been fractured in the last few years. Uh, that uh, you know, we live in a world uh, in which we would have thought to, to, to just pull out a piece that has you know, resonated, that the, our oversight of, say, the use of force by our police forces across the country would have been subject to significant regulation and it's proven to be difficult in the last few years. Uh, our deployment of uh, you know, extraordinary executive authority in the last few years has fractured a lot of that oversight and weakened the perception of congressional oversight, uh, less so judicial, but certainly weakened congressional oversight. And we're still dealing with the fallout from that. So that that's totally a non-cyber answer to your question, Charlie. But I think it's necessary to situate our cyber capabilities kind of in that milieu and realize that even though David's optimism is, I think, the reality of what we can and have done in the past and can aspire to in the future, it also is slightly off kilter at the moment. Let's, uh, um, unbelievably, uh, the hour has, has passed so rapidly. We just have a few few minutes left, but let let me try to capture a few few questions from the audience. Uh, uh, Mimi Kessler and Ed Colby have asked two different questions, but they are related. Ed wants to know: Can we harden our systems enough, or is and especially uh, he's has concern about our you know electrical, nuclear, water, and, and so forth. And Mimi says, 
and I'm kind of interpreting her question is, Jace Maurice, if somebody uses a password like SolarWinds123, shouldn't the system just re reject that? I mean, are there things that we can do that, uh, that wouldn't be particularly hard to, to you know, shore up our, our systems? Anyone? Oh, uh, the, on the second of those, we've been fighting that battle for 20 years, right? Um, you know, and uh, you can structure, I, I mean, Gary said it very early on, and, uh, and he's right. Security uh, is the, in counterpoise, is the enemy of usability in most cases. And uh, users across the globe, not just in the United States, but across the globe, have repeatedly chosen usability over uh, security every day and twice on Sunday, no matter how hard they're whacked, they default back to, I just want to be able to access my system. I don't care about the security. And whether it's, I mean, two-factor authentication is no panacea. It doesn't cure everything, but it is such an easy, simple hygiene method and uptake globally is still, you know, in the United States is still under 50%. Why? Because we're lazy. It's human nature. So, so the second part of that would be, eh, I, we can mandate it, but it won't happen. Eric? It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's because we're lazy. It's because uh, of what we prioritize, right? Immediate gratification over thinking about some of the, the burdens that would you take on with greater security. And oh, by the way, the diffuseness, it's sort of a um, externalization of the problem, right? Uh, the diffuseness of the, the problem overall is when you have these impactful, you know, cyber episodes, somebody else generally is, is really the, the front line of the victimization. And so I hear about it on the news, but it's not me directly. And so my incentive structure is a little bit different. Uh, all of which, you know, you would, some would hope that the marketplace would cure some of these ills, um, maybe not so fast. Uh, you know, the other thing to some of those questions, one thing that kind of rings true each and every time, and you can point to lots of examples, you can point to um, Maersk and WannaCry and others, is the resiliency piece. How do you build that in? Because, you know, you will never be able to completely firewall your way out of this problem. You can't build an impenetrable system in an interconnected environment. There's always going to be some vulnerability. Like first rule for a military communicator is redundancy of communications. You, you, you have to go into the fight assuming you're going to have some lines of communication severed. So what, what are your alternatives that you have set up? Uh, you know, that, that has got to be factored into the equation from an overall security posture. Yeah, I, I think, you know, resiliency is one thing, but, you know, and hardening, you know, and, and having alternatives is something else. Um, David, Charlie, can I add what, just, Charlie, just one quick thing I want to add to that. Once in fact, again, David, I, I want you to bring us home. You, you'll have the oh. last word. Sorry, Charlie. Um, I just, once again, maybe I, I, it's my role on the panel, voice of uh, naive optimism, I guess. Uh, but <laughs> I, I do think we should look at some of the things that have been put in place that really are working and ask if we can double uh, down on them and what it would take to double down on them. Um, a lot of really good work that people have been doing on Internet of Things cybersecurity and questions around software update and default passwords and whether we make things standards in that area and then what would it mean to be able to have a system that would encourage people to adopt those standards and norms. I think there's great work going on there. We should learn from that. The second piece is, I think if we go back to the Obama administration, the work that people like Ari Schwartz did for the development of the cybersecurity framework as a voluntary risk management standard that then can cause and encourage entities to adopt those norms. I think that has really worked. We're seeing countries all around the world adopt similar frameworks and take the uh, approach that US leadership provided. We should lean into that and really ask some questions like how do we further encourage organizations to robustly implement the cybersecurity framework? 
I think that those things will make a big difference. Well, thank you very much, David. And thanks everybody. I can't believe that an hour has transpired. This is this has been a, a very uh, rich discussion. And I want to thank each and each of you for making this time available. I think you, you really, I learned a lot and I know our audience did. Thank you so much and uh, hope to see you again and hope each of you write something for my blog, you know, from com coming from this wonderful discussion. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll, we'll see you back in uh, 10 minutes. We're going to take a break here. Uh, see you soon. Thank you.